Coming up on Harvard Chan This Week in Health, the public health impact of legalized marijuana. As it becomes legalized, we may see the advent of a very powerful marijuana industry. As more states legalize recreational marijuana, one expert highlights potential benefits, plus some concerns moving forward. Also in this week's episode, growing concerns over widely used chemicals known as phthalates. We'll take a closer look at new research showing how these chemicals may affect pregnancy. Hello and welcome to Harvard Chan This Week in Health. It's Thursday, December 1st, 2016, and I'm Noah Levitt. And I'm Amy Montemiro. We'll have more on those two stories in a moment, but first, a quick look at some other health stories making news this week. President-elect Donald Trump has nominated Congressman Tom Price to lead the Department of Health and Human Services. Price, a Republican from Georgia, has been a vocal critic of the Affordable Care Act, which Trump has pledged to dismantle. Price is a six-term congressman and an orthopedic surgeon. And as Secretary of Health and Human Services, he will be the nation's top health official. In Congress, Price has authored several pieces of legislation to repeal and replace the health care law, and has argued that Obamacare interferes with the ability of patients and doctors to make medical decisions. In the past, Price's proposed changes to the law have included a rollback of the Medicaid expansion, which has allowed states to expand insurance, as well as new limits on tax breaks for employers, which could reduce a business's incentive to provide coverage. If you want to read more about the health care impact of the Trump administration, you can visit our website to read Q&A with health policy expert John McDonough. Just head to hsph.me slash thisweekinhealth. Also in the news this week, officials in Texas are investigating a probable case of local transmission of Zika virus. This makes Texas the second state, in addition to Florida, where the infection has been passed from person to person by mosquitoes. The patient is a woman who lives in Brownsville along the Gulf Coast. And according to the New York Times, investigators are now working to determine if the infection has spread to anyone else. Health officials are asking the woman's neighbors for urine samples and are trapping mosquitoes to test for the virus. There have now been more than 4,400 confirmed cases of Zika in the continental United States, and more than 34,000 infections in Puerto Rico alone. Most of the cases in Puerto Rico have been locally transmitted. By contrast, many of those infected in the continental United States only became sick after traveling abroad to other countries. The World Health Organization announced this week that the world's first malaria vaccine will be rolled out across sub-Saharan Africa beginning in 2018. The vaccine, known as RTSS, targets P. falciferum, which is the deadliest malaria parasite and the most prevalent in Africa. Clinical trials have shown that the vaccine can provide partial protection against malaria in young children. A four-year pilot program will test the efficacy of the vaccine and will be used to determine if there should be a wide-scale expansion of that vaccine. New research shows that more than a billion people around the world have high blood pressure, most in low- and middle-income countries. That's according to a study from the Harvard Chan School and Imperial College London. Researchers found that the number of people with high blood pressure has nearly doubled in the last 40 years, and the burden has shifted to poorer countries, particularly Asia, which is home to half of the world's adults with high blood pressure. The takeaway, experts say, is that high blood pressure is now a condition of poverty, not affluence. They attribute the trend to differences in healthy food options and access to health services in low- and middle-income countries. The U.S., Canada, and South Korea had the lowest rates of high blood pressure, according to the study. Last month, people in four states, California, Nevada, Maine, and Massachusetts, voted to legalize recreational use of marijuana for people 21 and older. In all, eight states have now legalized recreational marijuana use, while several others allow the use of medicinal marijuana. The rapidly changing state of marijuana laws across the U.S. is drawing attention from public health experts. And we talked about the possible impact of these changes with Vaughn Rees, a lecturer on social and behavioral sciences at the Harvard Chan School and director of the School Center for Global Tobacco Control. Rees says the legalization of marijuana will have its biggest impact by reducing the long-term effects of drug-related arrests. The benefits clearly are the fact that criminalization of, of drug use behavior, of problem behavior, um, will, will no longer be the case in certain states or jurisdictions. Um, and in particular, the impact of, on, on the lives of young people who engage in, in recreational marijuana use won't, won't, be, uh, won't be a problem for them for the rest of their life, particularly around um, issues around um, uh, educational attainment, around seeking jobs, around uh, even around housing issues uh, that might be become unavailable to them as a consequence of having a criminal record for the use or possession of marijuana. So that's that's the big advantage. But Reese is also concerned that marijuana has been legalized in many states without any sort of regulatory framework being set up. 
He worries that without oversight, the marijuana industry will grow quickly, similar to the growth of the tobacco industry. As it becomes legalized, we may see the advent of a very powerful marijuana industry, much the same way that we saw the advent of a powerful tobacco industry in the 20th century. And the, uh, the nature of the industry is that it's, um, it's, uh, it seeks to generate profits, and it partly does that by targeting vulnerable um, members of the, the community and uh, developing products and targeting those products for use by those, those people. States have limited the use of marijuana to adults 21 and older, but recent other public health experts are concerned that a growing marijuana industry will target children and teens. While there is still much we need to learn about the health effects of marijuana, Reese says it is an addictive drug and its use among adolescents has been linked with cognitive impairments, including poor memory and educational problems. Additionally, Reese says more research is needed about the health effects of the act of actually smoking marijuana. Reese says that as health officials work to regulate marijuana, they can learn lessons from successful efforts to reduce tobacco use, especially among teens. We've done a great job over the past several decades in reducing demand for tobacco products. We saw back 50 years ago the, the, the prevalence of tobacco use in the United States was uh, among adults was very high. It's, it's now um, at the lowest it's ever been. Um, and the, the rate of uh, adolescent use of tobacco is down below 10%. And an interesting note here, Rees says that in many places, marijuana use among teens is far more prevalent than tobacco use. For example, a recent report from the Boston Public Health Commission showed that 42% of public high school students had used marijuana at least once in their lives, compared to less than 8% who had used tobacco. Rees says that's a sign that tactics to make it harder for adolescents to buy tobacco products have worked. And we've done that through various strategies that we need to think about um, how we can apply them to marijuana, including things like appropriate tax policy on, uh, on marijuana products. Um, reducing advertising and promotions of, uh, of tobacco has been important, and we could do that also with marijuana. Um, reducing uh, or limiting uh, ac accessibility of the product. Um, perhaps increasing the, the age of accessibility from 18 to 21 have all been uh, strategies that we've seen great impact with tobacco. The bottom line, Reese says, is that while there are some benefits linked to legalized marijuana, it's important to remember that it is still a drug with potential health consequences. That's why he's advocating for strict age regulations on usage, as well as continued communication about the risks associated with marijuana. If you haven't heard of phthalates, you've likely used a product manufactured using these synthetic chemicals. Phthalates are a large class of chemical compounds that are widely used to impart flexibility and durability to plastics. They can be found in a vast number of products, including vinyl tiles and flooring, food packaging toys, and other consumer products that are made of plastic. They can also be found in medical devices and pharmaceutical products, for example, in the coating of some oral medications. And certain phthalates are also used in the preparation of cosmetics and personal care products, for example, soaps and creams and um, that type of thing. That's Carmen Masurlian, a research fellow in the Harvard Chan School's Department of Environmental Health and the author of one of two new studies examining how phthalates may affect the health of pregnant women and their babies. Masurlian and Tamara James Todd, Mark and Catherine Winkler Assistant Professor of Environmental Reproductive and Perinatal Epidemiology, examine the effects of exposure to two kinds of phthalates, DEHP and MEP. DEHP is used to make plastics flexible and durable and is often used in manufacturing such as in tubing or conveyor belts in food processing plants. Because of its chemical composition, DEHP can easily leach out of these plastics, meaning that people can be exposed through the air, water, food, or even skin contact with these products. Masurlian's research looked at 256 women at Massachusetts General Hospital Fertility Center and found that pregnant women with the highest concentrations of DEHP were 60% more likely to have a miscarriage prior to 20 weeks of pregnancy than those with the lowest levels. That second study we mentioned, the one led by Tamara James Todd, looked at MEP, which is commonly found in personal care products such as fragrances and cosmetics. James Todd looked at a separate group of 350 pregnant women and found that high concentrations of that phthalate increased risk factors for gestational diabetes, including excessive weight gain during pregnancy and impaired glucose tolerance. James Todd says more research surrounding these findings is needed, but it is concerning because about half of the women who develop gestational diabetes go on to develop type 2 diabetes in the years following their pregnancy. The results of these two studies are important because pregnancy loss is prevalent. About 31% of all conceptions end in miscarriage, 
And the incidence of gestational diabetes has tripled over the past two decades, now occurring in 7% of all pregnancies worldwide. The challenge moving forward is finding ways for people to avoid phthalate exposure. While these chemicals don't build up in our bodies for a long time, we do have almost daily exposure to them. So what can you do? Masserlian and James Todd say that you can reduce consumption of processed and packaged foods, which may contain phthalates from contact with food processing or the packaging materials. You can also buy non-PVC shower curtains, non-PVC window blinds, and natural linoleum flooring instead of vinyl. And James Todd says you can also seek out a growing number of fragrance-free personal care products. I certainly see a growing market of personal care products that um, say fragrance-free, which is is nice to see. I do think that it's both companies being um, more cognizant of what is actually being used and its effects on human health. That is important as well as consumers being more educated about what they're actually putting on their bodies and how that may affect their health. And I think also doing a better job of training our physicians around um, you know, environmental health and the importance of really thinking about um, you know, exposures that uh, folks may get during pregnancy, even beyond pregnancy. Moving forward, Masserlian and James Todd are hoping to conduct studies which will examine whether changing the types of products we use will have real effects on health. That's all for this week's episode of Harvard Chan This Week in Health. I'm Amy Montemiro. And I'm Noah Levitt. We'll be back next week with a new episode, and we'll be taking a look at new research showing how certain mutations in our genes can affect our risk of developing some diseases. In the meantime, you can listen to any of our older episodes on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. Stitcher.